ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to um, No Die Classics. The other day I was watching uh, the commentary uh, on the Chesbra show of the uh, Batumi Chess Olympiad and I was uh, very, very much entertained by the newest recruit of uh, the Chesbra clan or group or whatever I should call them, uh, none other than Yasser Seherwan, a very, very well established and famous grandmaster from the 80s. And um, he was bringing up a few stories about his life. He's really, really good at that and uh, entertaining the crowds with uh, stories of the past. And I realized that uh, I should dedicate at least one Noda Classics to the genius of that guy. And um, I've uh, decided to bring you a game that he played against uh, Jan Timman. So it is a really, really high class uh match basically between two titans from the 80s and 90s i believe that both of them are oh, probably not say one team and definitely would have been top five uh in fact top three even uh at certain part of his career and uh i would uh, hazard that uh say one would have been top 10 in the world at one point too so we are talking about a very high profile clash and uh in many ways the game is super entertaining and really takes us back to basic principles which is why I really think that this series is quite beneficial for those who want to learn how to play good chess. So let's learn today from the one and only Yasser once again uh, and the new chess bra recruit. So, well not really that new by the way, at least I think he would be working with them for a year now. So Nimzo Indian with some transition, uh, it starts off as a Queen's Indian and then after B6 Yasser chucks in Knight C3. It is a clever move order because in some cases Black wants to play against Knight F3 setup something rather than B6 such as early C5s or D5. So he is a little bit uh, restricted in his choices now. And Queen B3 is uh, a little bit of a, um, a lesser known variation here. Bishop G5 is very topical and Queen C2. Excuse me, Queen B3 is a bit of a sideline, but um, not without Venom, as we are about to see very shortly. C5 was played, um, logical chess. By the way, A5, I believe, is the main, 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 main line. Um, A3 and Bishop A5. So that was the concept behind this setup for Black, that uh, because of the Queen now is on B3 instead of on C2, Bishop A5 is uh, a little bit more complicated to meet by an easy b4 for example because the queen is blocking the way so maintaining this pin uh, instead of giving that up the bishop right away makes a lot of sense now yasser when bishop g5 knight c6 and castles now this is really the first point where i would like to stop for a second because a lot of players would go here like oh i don't didn't like the idea of castles because this king is not safe and that's a totally false statement because Right now, what we need to notice is that uh, white is actually dominating the center. In fact, d5 is already threatened with pretty much winning the game on the spot. And also the black pieces are really not designed for uh, an attack on this side of the board. So if you look at how the bishop is looking, it's hitting via so this way instead of somewhere else where it would target down that way was the king so the only harm it can done is the trade of this knight which is not really harmful at all and the bishop also is looking at coming this way and thereby extending the diagonal that way instead of being able to develop via d5 and then bring the bishop out here controlling squares here which would be far more dangerous for the white king so long story short this is actually a brilliant move to bring the rook very quickly into the game and at the same time jumping out of this pin. A lot of people are way too afraid of these moves for no actual reason other than the oh it looks scary stories. So you really have to um, assess these positions and these moves on a case to case basis and here it is actually a really really fine move, I quite like it. The computer disapproves but I think the concept behind it is definitely something that is worth recognizing and if you cannot play the world number three in like in 12 moves you will see white will already be winning then it definitely does have merit bishop took on c3 somewhat pale queen take oh sorry haha <laughs> queen takes yes that's that's the big thing there Freudian slip that everyone takes it granted that once a piece gets taken we take it back 
not so. This is something that I talk a lot about on my channel, that uh, one thing that distinguishes a good player and a really good player is that a really good player always look uh, would look at uh, attacking another piece when there is one already hanging in order to complicate matters far more than what it already is and to basically inconvenience the opponent to a higher degree. The problem with queen c3 was that after c takes d4, knight takes d4, there was this very sneaky knight e4 move, which is a very ugly reminder to us that uh, sadly both white and black are entitled in this beautiful game of chess to use tactics. And now after bishop takes, knight takes, pawn takes back and knight takes back on d8, Although black is very much behind in development, but given that we are in an endgame, it's not really that important. But the pawn structure disaster is basically forecasting a very, very dark looking endgame for white. So hence, d5, and boy oh boy, this is a very unpleasant thrust. If the knight moves anywhere, I don't even know if you should look at it at all, then after queen takes c3, Black's position is falling apart. No central presence. The bishop is killing. The queen is killing. So on the dark squares, black is essentially dead. The king is still stuck in the middle. The position is just picture perfect. If on the other hand, the bishop is to run, well, it's very difficult to find a good square to go to. If we were to sack it away, again, the problem arises. The same story. If the knight moves, there is dramas here. If the knight comes out to a5, I suppose simply e4 and again look at the central domination. Absolutely stunning stuff. And after h6 bishop back g5, I would say that knight takes g5 is curtains right away because after takes takes there is nobody to defend the knight on f6. Beautiful, beautiful exploitation of the lack of the dark squared bishop. So Timman chose to take here first, which makes a lot of sense, takes back and then he retreated the bishop to e5. So the position that he was hoping for was that after takes, queen takes, pawn takes, bishop takes, he thought that he sufficiently managed to catch up in development and uh, would be able to complete said development by rook d8 and castles. The problem is that it still takes one too many moves to get the king out of harm's way because if, for example, after e3, which was the text move, he castles, then he loses a piece by force by simple means of capture, capture, and capture. Which is a really easy chess, but sometimes these things, as you can see, can decide the battle between two 2650, which is today terms like 2750 grandmasters. It's basic chess principles. King stuck in the middle, you go at it like crazy. And that is exactly uh, what he did say around here by actually pulling the trigger. Now, black is basically announcing, I'm about to castle, in which case, actually, black would be better, because then, indeed, the white king would begin to feel a little bit iffy. But, as we like to say, chess is uh, the tragedy of the one tempo, and that one tempo is missing, and the asset didn't need to be asked twice to pull the trigger. Rook takes d7. Beautiful, beautiful move. Absolutely stunning. Uh, basically putting the rook on uh, on prey by one, two, three, four pieces and yet none of them can actually take without causing serious damage uh, and uh, as such this move especially with the obvious follow up bishop b5 strongly reminds me know your classics uh, to the world famous Morphe game which I'm not going to bring up now but Morphe versus consultants probably the most famous chess game ever played and if you don't know what I'm talking about, I highly recommend you to look it up. So here is how pattern recognition works. And I did talk about this before in this very series where I actually discussed in a couple of videos, uh, not one, but several games that were based on the same motif, how the later games and the players who played those later games knew the games that were played before and recognized the same pattern in their game. Same works here for Yasa. He would have 100% guaranteed recalled here the famous Morphe versus Consultants, which exactly went the same way that when the rook retook. Well, actually, the bishop was already on b5, so the rook could come to d1. But in this case, simply playing bishop b5 is winning enough because, again, on castles, we have the same procedure to win a piece. And so, consequently, again, black cannot castle, and now it is really a long... Um, 
well, sorry, I lost uh, lost chaos right, basically because now it is not going to be possible anymore for black, no matter what they try um, to sort of hold this together. The bishop went back to d6. Obviously, again, the plan is to castle and not leaving uh, the bishop on prey. Rook d1, bringing the last dude into the attack. Beautiful chess again. Um, castles, better later than never, I suppose, but um, the, the damage is basically done and the consequences will be deadly. Bishop takes d7, knight can't take because of the pin. Ooh, I forgot to show you something. Um, in case of king takes, there was a beautiful attack here. By knight takes e5, queen takes check, king here. Note that king here loses to bishop check and mate. Whereas queen back loses the queen to check, king up and uh, check. Mm, yeah, not quite mate, but yeah, loses the queen. And um, so queen c6, king c6, sorry. And again, the beautiful bishop f4 decides the matter because now queen c7 mate is going to happen if the queen moves away from e5. So that was again the, the punishment against king takes. Queen takes obviously loses the queen to bishop b5. Knight takes is out of the question because the queen is hanging and so hence rook takes, bishop back, bishop d6, rook d1 castles. And here he opted, there are lots of forced wins here, he opted for takes, takes and bishop f4 which was one of the easiest c4 not quite a spite check but a spite tactic against uh white obviously take would uh, turn everything around because of rook c8 pinning uh, the queen but uh, that was not to happen queen c2 knight e8 only move to defend the piece and please note that every single time when you feel like the win is in the pocket the best way and the fastest way to achieve the w is to be extremely aggressive and that's exactly what Yasa does so now that black has, black is completely tied down to the defense of the d6 bishop he now creates a super awkward mate threat as well as a threat of jumping back to e4 and winning the piece the only move that stops both is f5 and um, now again many moves would have been winning according to the engine queen d2 would have been more accurate than the text but the text was perfectly sufficient too. Queen takes c4 check, king h8, bishop d6, knight takes, and again the pin is becoming deadly. Rook d8, knight in, hitting the rook, hitting the knight if the rook moves, they have to go away with the check, king moves, and now again pin is on, rook is hanging, whoops, and I'm pressing the wrong button. Um, so they played rook d7, allowing Yasa to finish off with a beautiful knockout punch. Queen takes d6, and uh, white resigned. I don't know why I have a draw down there, but I uh, don't believe in that. Queen takes d6, and uh, sorry, black resigned, because after rook takes, rook takes, in order to stop this check, uh, black would have to give up the queen for the rook, and white would easily win with his extra piece. So once again, the main features of the game were this very ballsy castles here which allowed white to create a very quick attack on the d5 in conjunction with this quick um, d5 thrust even against the piece capture so remember we are not playing checkers recapture is not compulsory and once the position opens up white is relentless in pursuing this attack against the king stuck in the middle which is probably the main theme of this game um, and a theme that occurs very very often and remains unexploited in many many games on club level is the king stuck in the middle which is very rarely met with the necessary aggression that of course on this level of chess is done very often and that's why it's good to watch the classics because the way how they do it is just so inspiring takes takes and the dude is just going for it all the time the aggression look at that Every single move is an attack or a capture from this point on. Take, attack, attack, take, attack. Now that had to be a retreat, but again, basically that's an in-between move when the attack hasn't been dealt with on d6. Attack again, capture, capture, attack, attack, and capture. This is how good chess is played. When there is a, this 
incredibly natural flow of punch after punch after punch, eventual knockout. That's how good chess is played, and this is why we need to know our classics because they help us to learn how to play good chess. I hope you guys enjoy this video. Kudos to Yasser for playing awesome chess and now uh, for popularizing chess in a different way altogether. Um, I hope you guys enjoy this video and I will be back with more soon. Thanks for watching. Bye.